Galatians chapter 6. We're going to look at the last half of this chapter together as we finish up, Lord willing, our study verse by verse through this great book together. Galatians chapter 6. In just a moment, we'll begin in verse number 11. Um, just a word of housekeeping tonight. Reminder that tonight after church, we do have a church family meeting. And so I encourage all of our members to hang with us for that for a bit. And then one thing of note, uh, more to come on this, but we're having a few, and have you noticed the building's getting fuller? And that's a good thing, right? Especially on Sunday mornings. And um, we, were having, we were having multiple logistical challenge was, challenges with that. And so that's a really good thing. Um, and I was telling the deacons uh, and pastoral staff, some of us met this evening, just uh, working on some of those growth points and growing pains. And one thing, I heard someone say this recently, they said, anytime you try to fix a problem, all you do is trade one set of problems for a new set of problems. And uh, the question you always have to ask yourself is, do we like the new set of problems better than the old set? And if we do, then, hey, that's a, that's a win. And uh, so we're growing, and, and, and we're, uh, again, we're trying to get this space done, and then you can pray with us as we, you, you probably sense by now, I'm always on to the next thing, and I'm not trying to slave drive you, just we always have to be working and improving and strengthening things. And so we're hoping to get this other hallway at some point uh, resolved. We'll have another one just like this one, Lord willing, with our layout, which will help with some of the pressure relief valves and reallocate our office spaces a bit. But anyway, all of that to say, um, with things being tighter and snugger as we're growing, um, we've started to notice some things with our young people or some things that we've had in the past, but now as we're getting tighter, so just tonight, one little seed thought, one packet more later. But if you could, during our business meeting tonight, instead of letting the youngins just run through the building or do their own thing, we're going to try to do that together. So if you could keep your kids with you, we'll have about a five-minute break, use the restroom. If you do need to take your kids out, that's fine, but go with them, okay? Um, that's what we would ask. So don't just stay in here with your spouse and enjoy a little date, romantic date for a few minutes as your kids do. You know what or you don't know what. Um, so just help us with that logistically afterwards. And then because of the emphasis on the next gen aspect as well, uh, our teens are going to start sitting in on our business meetings. I think that's good for them to do. Um, so I guess my point is just, it's not just the few of us adults in for that meeting uh, at the end of church. I encourage you to stay for that as a family. If you do need to step out, feel free to do that, but make sure your kids are uh, in tow and you're responsible for them. Does that make sense? Uh, and some other things we'll tweak on Sundays we'll talk about in the future here that I think will be a help in that direction as well. All right, Galatians chapter 6 tonight. Let's begin in verse 11, and we'll read down through verse 18. And I've really enjoyed this journey through Galatians with you. Appreciate you sticking with me on it uh, and uh, allowing it to just challenge your thinking and strengthen your faith in God's grace. Verse 11, Paul is winding down this robust treatise, if you will, upon the grace of God versus the law of man. And notice if you feel verse 11, he says, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. If you remember, we talked about in days gone by, possibly his thorn in the flesh was his eyesight. And um, now he chooses, in contrast with the rest of the book, to write this with his own hands. It's kind of fun to think about, isn't it? That this last section we're going to read tonight, Paul probably wrote these words himself instead of dictating them as he had most of the New Testament, his contributions to it. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that, notice this, they may glory in your flesh. And I put up at the very top of my Bible, motive of a legalist. And you may want to put that in your bio if you mark it as well. We'll come back to that in just a moment. That they may glory in your flesh. Verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them, and mercy uh, and upon the Israel of God. And we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. For henceforth, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, I love this, how he ends, the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, with your spirit. Amen. And so we've been looking at Plus Nothing, a study on gospel grace in the book of Galatians. And tonight we want to end by looking at Grace Elevated. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the joy it is to be here in this setting tonight. Thank you for what you did this morning. 
new folks that Heidi and I shared lunch with that you've allowed to be a part of visiting our church, just all the new faces and as well those that uh, just continue to be faithful and to see through um, all that you're doing in our respective lives and ministries. And just pray tonight as we finish this book that you would um, just solidify things we've been thinking on and maybe even stewing on. And, and Lord, bring this to a culmination, bring this to a conclusion. That Lord, we can rest in your grace and we can rely upon you as we walk out our journey of faith before you. Um, without um, the tendencies that uh, we see Paul confronting so directly in this book. Help our walk to be truly grace plus nothing. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in our time tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Um, any of you uh, Peanuts fans like the cartoon, the Charlie Brown, all of that? I don't know if any of you are or not. I love the backstory to it because Charles Schultz, there was more than met the eye, Right? Uh, to his writings, whether it's Linus putting down his blanket in the Christmas pageant, and uh, as they're singing the song that they're singing, there's just a lot of subliminal messaging uh, in it um, that I find fascinating. But one of the things I love about the Peanuts uh, cartoon is when they sing, their head just goes straight up, right? And all you can see is the outline of their nose and their, like, their double chin, you know, singing the little pudgy little characters. Um, have you ever thought about the voices behind that? Um, the other day, somebody sent me a picture. This is, the, um, this is just four of the characters behind the original Peanuts cartoon. So on the left is the mean Lucy character, okay? It'd be fun to meet that. Uh, per, but even their outfits, you know, they kind of shows you the date. Uh, I don't know if that's pegboard behind them or what that is behind them there. But the, the different characters. And so there you have... Um, Peppermint, Patty, right, Charlie Brown, and then who's the one on the right again? That's line, okay. So, and then just their voices and just visualizing them. Those are the kids, for the kids tonight, those are the kids behind the original uh, Peanuts characters, and they would record them and then set that to music and all that goes with that. But I always think of, when I think of, of singing to the, to the heavens, I always think of them tilting their heads back and just singing in a vertical way. Um, can I say to you tonight, as it relates to the grace of God, there is a level that God wants to take you and me tonight, and this week, and this month, and the rest of our lives, that we will never get to without the grace of God. Sure, you can, you can, you can suppress your, your flesh, and you can try to conform it, and you can try to structure your life, and there's a certain level that you probably can achieve, at least from man's standards. But I'm telling you, there's a level of elevated relationship with God and ministry for God and walk with God that you will never get to without the grace of God. Plus nothing, minus nothing. And I just want to whet your appetite as we finish tonight this great book. What heights could you achieve if you truly were defined only by the grace of God? And there are nuances and little crevices in our theology. We've let legalism and flesh and carnality creep in uh, that need to be replaced with this grace that we have been studying. And so I'd like you to ask that question tonight. Where could I be and where could I be not just tonight but six months from now if I would lean more into God's grace and less upon my own flesh and religiosity and the standards and perspectives of others that are around me? And so in the end of the letter, Paul has grace in mind. You see it, he emphasizes it here, in fact, includes it in the final verse uh, of the book, emphasizing that the Christian who depends upon grace through the Spirit will bring glory to God at levels that otherwise are not possible. And so the question tonight is this, in a day of even religious folks being willing to settle for far less than all that God has intended, how do we, in contrast, allow His grace to help us live on higher ground? Let's talk about tonight two lifestyle elevations, two things that happen when we live by grace alone that lift our lifestyle to a different level, that get us beyond uh, maybe the religious uh, accomplishments of others and get us to where God intends us to be. Number one, let's talk for a few minutes, first of all, about God. When we're dependent squarely and only upon His grace, we are elevated in what we glory in. So instead of settling for less in the area of glory, we allow God to elevate uh, our glory. What we glory in, what we revel in, what we celebrate uh, as we walk before Him. Let's talk about a couple things under that. And our outline's there in the bulletin, if that helps you tonight. Number one, 
allow grace to elevate you above selfish glory. Um, one of the things that's most, in my view, frustrating about legalism, I, I would probably at times, I, I, we all have things that we tend to be legalistic about, no things we're too loose on or too license-oriented. But one of the things I've noticed that when I'm in my legalistic mindset, I tend to make it too much about me, right? Glorying in how I'm better than so-and-so, and and I have this in order that they don't have in order. And instead of focusing on where I need to change and grow, I'm focused on how I'm better than them. And I begin to glory in myself in ways that lower uh, my sense of what is truly glorious. Um, I don't know if you have this or not. I have a battle with passwords. Do any of you have this as we are living in such a digital age? I can't remember. My, I, Brother Josh Carney, regularly we have this conversation. He's helping me with something. He's like, well, what's your password? And then he knows there's a pause. He's like, I can't help you with your password. Like, you've got to know your password. I can do everything else, but I can't help you with that. Um, I have some of my devices that they require me to update my password every whatever, like 60 days. Literally, people, I have none left, okay? I have no passwords left in me. So I do now the auto-generated ones that are like all kinds of symbols and letters. And if my computer ever forgets what that password is, you know, the auto-save or whatever, I am stuck, okay? And they're sending me all these verifications to get me to change my password. Can I say to you as it relates to glory, that if you glory in self, that doesn't end well. And here's a couple of angles to this that I'm finding in my own life. First of all, if I glory in self, I'm going to come to the end of my positive attributes. And eventually, I'm going to start loathing myself. Self-hate is a thing in our day. Because if it's all about me, when I start bumping into issues with me, I become disillusioned. I become... Um, I I begin to to even think of harming self or disconnecting or disengaging from self. And so glorying in self can take us in that direction. The other thing that it will do is often it will bring us to new lows, shameful lows. If we make it all about us, we'll begin to do things that we never thought we would do and tolerate things and engage in things that we never thought possible uh, to be part of our lives. And here's the thing, oftentimes our glory in self looks very religious. We, we, we glory in who we are and how we're perceived and the standards and even the convictions that we possess divorced from um, the grace and the glory of God. And so Paul here is trying to convince them and remind them as he closes that real Christianity is a matter of inward change not external rituals and observances. It's more than that. It's about what's going on inside of us. And so Paul begins by dealing with the motives of the false teachers. We'll come back to verse 11 in just a moment. But in verse 12 and 13, Paul calls out the motives of those who are misleading away from God's grace, um, these teachers. And I said to this to you at least once in this series, I believe, before, Anybody who approaches you and claims to be representing God, you ought to ask the following question before you listen to anything. Why are they trying to influence me? What's their angle? And if their angle is anything less than the glory of God and the grace of God, uh, we should distance ourselves from them. We're settling uh, for that which glories in self. Because what a false teacher does is they actually appeal to your desire to glory in self, right? Right? Um, Glory in your religiosity, glory in your rules, glory in the externals. And so Paul here confronts those. All right, let's look at these two motives. First, verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, all right, the external religious observance, only lest, here's (laughs) their motive, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Number one, jot this down, selfish avoidance. The Judaizers wanted to make a good show in the flesh by building up this large group of followers and emphasizing external requirements. It's interesting to me, have you ever read about some of these cults and you're like, how in the world did everybody go along with these things they required? You know, that actually appeals to our base nature. I'll do anything on the outside that helps me avoid having to deal with what's going on inside whether it's legalism or license or cultism, or we could go through all kinds of things, but that is the base motivation of most false religion. Let's do a bunch of external things 
They help us all forget about the shameful things, the wrong things that God's trying to change with his grace uh, and his mercy. And so Paul calls that out at the beginning of verse 12. But notice he goes on, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And so Paul sees through the insincerity of these false teachers and accuses them of seeking by emphasizing legalism, avoiding the persecution that comes for identifying with the cross of Christ. Because what the cross does is it actually condemns our flesh. The cross says, in our flesh dwelleth no good thing, even a religious flesh. Jesus didn't come to die just for the people who had no rules or standards. (laughs) He came to save those with the most rules and the most standards. Because our main issue is that which is going on inside. And so Paul here confronts these who are avoiding the tougher elements of relationship with God, uh, which involve the internal and that which involves the cross. And one of the things I'm fascinated by is the legalists are always saying, we have the higher standard. We have the higher standard. We have the ideal. No, they're settling for an easier, a much easier approach to God. One also that is largely flawed, identifying with grace is a costly identification. All right, verse 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Number two, selfish promotion. So selfish avoidance. They're trying to avoid the internal issues. They're trying to avoid the cross of Christ. Number two, selfish promotion. And it's interesting at the beginning of verse 13 that Paul says those who make the most fuss about the law are the ones who never keep the law. They have no interest in the law itself. They have no interest in keeping even God's revealed law. They simply want to obtain converts by emphasizing externals and generating a long list of followers. One commentator said this, an attempt to win others to that which was itself bankrupt. That's what these individuals are doing. For not even those who were circumcised were able to keep the law. It's not like the external uh, observance was going to help them one bit uh, be more law-abiding. Those leading could not even obey. And I would contrast that with Christ, the one who was so hated by the legalist of his day, where he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to what? To fulfill. And the fulfilling of the law comes only through the grace of Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled the law. And so may we identify with him as opposed to these who claim the law and yet cannot even keep it themselves. All right, the end of verse 13, they desire to have you circumcised. Why? What's their agenda? What's their angle? Again, what's their motivation? That they may glory in your flesh. Get credit for proselytizing these Gentiles. We came, look at how they're dressing different. Look at how they're now observing the feast. Look at how all these external things have changed. Not to give God glory, listen to me, but to settle for getting the credit themselves. That would be another question I would ask you is this, who gets the credit for the ones that lead and influence in your life? Who gets the credit for that? It ought to be God and it ought to be his grace, not their great leadership or their great influence It must be the Lord. Um, I don't know if this is as true as it was in days gone by, but one of the saddest profiles of faith that I see, at least saw in days gone by in the church, not, I can't think of this in our church at the moment, but one of the saddest profiles of the faith is a controlling father who only cares how his wife and kids make him look. You ever been around a man like that? Then they're not concerned about the standard or the rules as it relates to God or the well-being of their children or their wife. It's all about how they make their father look, how they make their husband look. Grace produces in us a greater profile than this. Just seeking our own credit, seeking our own following, it keeps the focus upon the Lord. See, the ultimate motivation of the legalist is not to help us or to bless us. It is to help their own profile by what their followers wear, how they behave, how they talk, etc. It's all about them. May we not be found in that group as we stay faithful to God's grace. By the way, these false saviors, the Judaizers were claiming to be, um, their teaching, all that they were doing, uh, was not leading people closer to the Lord, it was actually leading them further away. Um, In fact, I would submit to you, we don't have time to look at it at length, but go back to chapter 4 for just a minute, 
in verse 17. Uh, it says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. We talked about this a few weeks ago, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. In verse 17, basically to summarize, a legalist will use their followers for a sense of self-salvation. They're, they're, they're using people to prop up their own sense of self and their own status before God himself. It's a, it's, a, it's a form of self-salvation. And so may we, instead of focusing on the, as these externals and the superficial agendas, may we focus on the heart, may we focus on the mind, may we focus upon the soul. May I say to you tonight, until your faith is in grace plus nothing, you will always eventually make it, even religion, about self-glory. If your confidence, if your faith, if your reliance is not in the grace of God alone, plus nothing, you will eventually make it about self-glory. And no one in this room is an exception to that tendency. So may God help us. All right, number two, go back to chapter 6 and verse 11. Paul says this before he gets to confronting the motives. He says, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with mine own hand. Number two, jot this down. <laughs> Allow grace to elevate you unto sacrificial glory. So we dealt with the negative. Allow, allow the grace of God to elevate you above selfish glory. That's getting rid of the negative. Number two, allow grace to elevate you unto, here's the positive, sacrificial glory. Um, I joke my wife regularly, and she's in the nursery tonight as she is every Sunday night typically in the areas that she serves um, but what I love about Heidi, you can tell her I said this, okay, just in case the doghouse is, door is open tonight when I get home. Um, she is not self-conscious whatsoever. Um, we just had a Christmas party for most of our leadership team that serve in our church and some of our key volunteers and uh, Pastor Dave, who always has very mature and just like highbrow kind of activities, had us, um, he would put a song up on the screen and then we had to play it with a kazoo. And my wife was one of the first people to pop up, and she kind of got befuddled, got off pitch, if that's possible, in a kazoo, at least was her view of it after the fact. But she just popped up, and, and that's just not me, okay? I, I'm not a good kazooist, if that's a word, um, and I, I'm not one on the fly. I like to know what I'm getting into and what I'm going to do. That's just how I'm wired. But she, she's always, and, and you know this, all of the, the homes in this room represented, this church is, is represented by a lot of sacrifices, Right? Nobody's probably sacrificed more for this church, and I know for our family, than my wife has. But it's something she, she glories in. She actually, it, it's, she's, she's just, that's just how she's wired. You know the grace of God ought to produce that profile in us? Here's what I would ask of you. Has God's investment of grace in your life, is there a return on it? Like we talk about God's grace gives me this, and God's grace gives me that. And God's grace leads me from having to be a part of this. And it's all about what we get out of it. Do you know the grace of God, when it's truly what it should be, it produces explosions and spreading of sacrifice in our lives that we're making because of what it's done in us. Is there a return on the investment of God's grace in your life? Are there things that you're sacrificing instead of playing loose with because of the grace of God? That's the spirit that Paul's talking about here in verse 11 as well as verse 14. And so in verse 11, I think we see here, first of all, a sacrificial love. Paul loved these people so much that despite the pain that it involved or the strain that it was upon him, he chose to write. Can you see this great apostle? Almost like a little child trying to form the letters. Um, I think evidence is a genuine love for a, a church that was really struggling church that had been infiltrated by legalism and, and, and circumcision and all of these externals, Paul evidences a sacrificial love. By the way, a love that these false teachers did not have. They didn't, they didn't give anything up for this church. They, in fact, asked of this church. They didn't love this church. They were manipulating this church. And so Paul here goes full tilt with love. And so may we tonight allow our hearts to be warmed by God's grace and then to allow it to move us to a level of sacrificial love. This large letter, even with his poor eyesight, Paul wanted to write these last words himself. And so Paul seizes the pen from his scribe. As we've seen throughout the letter, there's no theological treatise here as he does in the rest of the letter. It's just a letter of one man who loves 
this group of men and women. And he wants to appeal to them one last time from a heart of love. Uh, You may want to jot this down. I think this is a good point to check our theology because all of us have theology, right? Just a belief about God. But this is key. I would write this down if I were taking notes. Any theological position that is not motivated by love and cannot be manifested through love, any theological position that is not motivated by love and cannot be manifested through love is out of step with the God of all grace. If your theology is not fueled by and sustained by love for God and for your neighbor, and if you can't express it in a loving way, it is not in sync with the God of the Bible. Because the God of the Bible who gives us his grace always manifests in his people the vessels filled with his grace uh, with this heart of love. Um, One of the things I find regularly, I mentioned I was at a, a preacher's conference this last week, and Man, it's just, everybody wants to put you in a hole. you got to be this or you got to be this, right? I don't know if you feel that pol- politically or whatever. There's all kinds of things that you're either for this or you're against that. A pastor friend of mine said this, I won't be somebody else's enemy in order to be your friend. Just let me love you both. Just let me love you both. And a lot of times what this, this, this legalism t- is, it's, it's you either are their friend or you're, and you're my enemy or you're my friend and you're their enemy. The grace of God gives us another path, and that pathway is a loving, gracious spirit toward both uh, parties. Maybe we don't agree, but we can love. You can't force me not to love you. You can't. I have to force myself to love you sometimes, and probably you do as well, me. But you can't, and you can't triangulate me against someone else to abandon what the grace of God says is possible. The grace of God says love is always an option. All right, go to verse 14, and notice the second component of this. He says, but God forbid that I should glory, saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me. Notice this, the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Number two, sacrificial crucifixion. So Paul evidences here a higher level than only grace of God, the grace of God can take us. Sacrificial love. Number two, sacrificial crucifixion. And so in verse 14, the contrast is vivid. The Judaizers are trying to avoid the cross, right? Back in verse number 12, Paul, instead of even disassociating from it, he doesn't just associate with it, he glories in it. Um, he, He goes next level with glory. He glories in that which is the object of shame. That which man looks at and sees only shame, the grace of God in its place sees great glory. Um, And so he glories in the Savior. They gloried in the flesh, right? As we just read in verse 13, he glories in the cross. And so the grace of God gives us the ability to glory in something higher than our flesh. What does the cross do? It's a place where the flesh is crucified. That's the shamefulness of the cross. The glory is Jesus and what he has done for us. And so it is the grace of God, not the flesh, that we are to glory in. Somebody said this, listen to these words, a bit lengthy of a reading, but I think it's important to read it tonight. Someone said this, if the cross is just a help, but you have to complete your salvation with good works, that's often the profile of the legalist, it is really your works which make the difference between your being headed for heaven or not headed for heaven. Did you catch that? So if it takes anything plus the cross, then, then it's our works that makes the difference. Therefore, you boast about your flesh, your own efforts. What an attractive sounding message to be able to pat yourself on the back for having reserved a place for yourself in heaven. But if you understand the gospel, you boast exclusively and only in the cross. Our identity, our self-image is based on what gives us a sense of dignity and significance. That's what we boast in. Religion leads us to boast in something about us. The gospel leads us to boast in the cross of Jesus. Listen to these words. That means our identity in Jesus is confident and secure. We do boast, yet humbly, based on a profound sense of our flaws and our neediness. That's our choice, brethren. And the grace of God says and motivates us to sacrifice our flesh and our pride in it and to rely only on upon the cross of Jesus Christ. Notice the end of verse 14, he says, by whom the world, this cross, is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And so here the world system with all of its allurements, its fleshly displays, its religiosity, 
is cast aside by Paul. Paul says, it is dead to me. And then in contrast, or the flip side, he says he looks at the world as if it is on a cross. The world looked at Paul as though he were on a cross. And this, this eye to eyeball, the world's on a cross, Paul's on a cross, frees him from glorying in anything but the cross of Jesus Christ. Notice that Paul does not say the world is dead, but that it is dead to him. Have you ever had someone say that? You're dead to me. And then you hug. Now that's not usually what happens, right? That's a, that's a termination of relationship. You're dead to me. The gospel destroys the power of this world. Why? If nothing in the world is where I locate my righteousness or my salvation, if there's nothing in this world that I boast in, then there's nothing in this world that controls me. I'm free. I'm free. And the grace of God alone elevates us to that level where I don't, I don't need your approval. I don't need your applause. I don't even need your criticism, your assessment. I am defined by the grace of God. It frees us from the fear of man. It frees us from the bondage of the flesh, a level we never get without the grace of God. And so trying to legislate morality actually intensifies our fleshly desires. Have you ever noticed that? The more you try to suppress your flesh, the stronger it comes back, right? Um, just say no. That was the big anthem against drugs when I was in high school in the 80s. Just say no. How did that work out for us? Drugs have exponentially exploded in our culture. Um, just saying no is not enough. We have to say yes to something that replaces it, and that for us are the spiritual glories of God's grace, something we continue to grow in as we yield ourselves to its influence in our lives. So ultimately here, Paul says that the heart of your religion is what you boast in. Can I ask you this question tonight? What at the very bottom, at the very base of your religion and your relationship with God, what is the reason you think you have a right to a relationship with God? And whatever that foundational reason is why you, th you dare to think you can relate to God, it better be the grace of God. Because if it ain't, you're never going to achieve the levels, whether you know Jesus or not, you're never going to arrive at the levels of growth and progress and spiritual maturity that God yearns for us to experience. Final thought on this, we'll move to our second point. Somebody said this, why is the gospel of grace so offensive to the self-righteous? Why does it bother them so much? And here was his reason. Because grace takes the glory away from man and gives it all to God. And that's why we all just kind of, you mean I'm no different than anybody else that's not living the good life and the moral thing that I, no one's different intrinsically in God's sight? It takes the glory away from us and our flesh and puts it only and entirely upon God himself. All right, go to verse 15. Let's talk about a second elevated level that only the grace of God can take us and sustain us in that Paul experienced. And I think he, he longed for these people and us uh, to experience as, as well. Look at verse 15. For in Christ, neither circumcision availeth or accomplishes or is valued in anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Number two, let's talk for a minute secondly about elevated in standard. So grace takes us to a new level uh, as it relates to glory. Number two, it takes us to a new level as it relates to the standard, what we measure up against. Um, so we're just finishing Galatians, and, and I hope you've enjoyed our study. Some would like maybe more topical, you know, just let's just have Q&As every Sunday night, or let's just talk about felt needs, and there are places for that, and we will do that this coming Sunday but by and large, our church believes in preaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the Word of God. God put it in that order for a reason. It's amazing to me how things sync up if we just preach through, and then it's like, hey, this just happened in our lives or our church life, and it, it speaks to us in the specific areas. Uh, we believe in that. I don't, I don't think topical ought to be the primary fare uh, or menu that the shepherd is feeding the sheep, the under-shepherd. I was reading the other day, someone said this, I think this is so good, and this is my thinking, I hope it'll be your thinking as you evaluate your relationship with God's Word. A biblical sermon does not start with a topic, it starts with a text. And I think typically a biblical sermon uh, is formed in that manner. And you don't make a sermon more biblical by stacking up dozens of scripture references on top of the topic, you make it more biblical by going deeper into a single text. 
That's the standard. And that's what we've done in this text. I, I haven't picked on your rules or mine. We've just worked our way through this, the, this book. And so the word of God is the standard and God's grace elevates the standard from our topics and our takes on things to what God's word clearly declares. Not saying we can't use other scripture to support what we're teaching, but stick with primarily that single text, go deeper into it, will give us uh, what God has for us. Uh, and so grace always maintains or strengthens the standard of God's word. So anything, I always get not just nervous, I, I, I pull out when I feel any religious perspective is undermining my view of this book. Anybody with me on that? If I sense that someone claims to represent God and they're criticizing and undermining and questioning the word of God, I'm out, okay? I don't care what else you have to say because God's grace has given us the standard of his word. That's the standard by which everything is measured. We can't settle for just religious traditions, what our comfort level is, especially as it relates to preferential things, other Christians, even church leaders. The standard of God's grace and how we're to use it is the word of God and it alone. And so that's the standard that we allow to rule and reign uh, in our lives. All right, let's talk about a couple things as we finish as it relates to this standard that we only have access to fully through the grace of God. Number one, allow grace to elevate you above external standards. So we'll talk about the negative first, that when we we're fully in sync with God's grace, it brings us above, it frees us from uh, what are external oriented standards. And I would give you two of them that he men mentions. First in verse 15, as we just talked about, he first of all says, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision. Number one, external rituals. So what grace does is it uncouples us from external rituals and it gets us to a new level with just this. Like, I don't need rituals. I don't need, I don't need routines and formulas. I just need the word of God. And so grace frees us from that which is an external ritual. Although at first sight, this verse um, may not seem real important, I would submit to you, it might be one of the most important verses of the entire book. Because the main issue, tangibly speaking, was to be circumcised or not to be circumcised. It's the crux of the book. It's the key, one of the key verses in the book. And he says that it doesn't matter if you are or if you're not. The external ritual has nothing to do with your standing before God. Jewish teachers made it everything depend upon the observance of this one ceremony. Circumcision was the foundation of Judaism. Paul sweeps it aside with one flourish. Can you imagine the intake of air of the Judaizers in the room? It doesn't matter if you are, it doesn't matter if you're not. I mean, that just destroys everything that they had been taught and everything that they had believed in for all that led to this moment. But it's interesting, Paul doesn't just say circumcision matters nothing, he also says uncircumcision. So there's those of us, we're for it, that's who we are. And then there are those that, well, we, yeah, we don't believe in circumcision, and we take just as much pride in that. And Paul says neither Neither position matters one iota uh, in our relationship and standing with God. It is by grace alone. And so to let an external physical standard be what defines us, either for or against it, is to miss out on the newness of life that is only possible through the grace of God. And here's what I find in our ranks, and probably this is true even in the room, a lot of our theology is defined by what we're for and what we're against instead of the grace of God. Should we be for some things? Yes. Should we be against some things? Yes. But our core identity is found only in the grace of God. Um, the gospel gives us a new motivation for obedience, this grateful love that we have for God because of what he's done for us. This is what renews us. This is what changes us from the inside out. It has nothing to do with our flesh. It has nothing to do with an external ritual of our flesh is defined by what God is doing in us. Um, I was reading the other day an author talking about this discernment, and he said this, listen to these words, so good, and something we're trying to practice in our ministry here. He said, discernment is marked by restraint. Saving thus saith the Lord, he put that in quotes, only in those areas in which the scriptures clearly lay out a principle and a path. Otherwise, we eviscerate Christian freedom and bind the consciences of believers without Christ's authority. 
And so we have to be very careful with that. This is the standard, not adding externally oriented rituals of, I don't know, even communion or baptism and things that we start getting into how frequently or uh, different things where we nuance things in ways that God has not given us and letting that be the source of our identity. Be very careful not to bind the consciences of other believers without Christ's authority. Where the Bible is clear and where it's, it's robust, we ought to be clear and robust in what we say. And where it either says nothing or very little, we ought to there in that very place say nothing or little. All right, so it frees us from external rituals. Number two, look at verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them, be on them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. Number two, external inconsistency. So it frees us from external rituals. Number two, it frees us from external inconsistency. Now, what is Paul talking about here in verse 16 where he says, as many as walk according to this rule, R-U-L-E? What is he talking about there? I believe he's referencing, as you see back in verse 15, if he says this rule, he's referring back to the end of verse 15, which is this, we are a new creature. Um, The new rule is the rule of the new creation, that God is creating something new in us and through us by his grace and for his glory. And for those who are ruled by this rule, by this new creation that God is doing in us, that has nothing to do with circumcision or uncircumcision, he pronounces this double blessing. Here are two things we'll experience when this is true of us. Number one, we have peace. And number two, we have mercy. Um, And so the question we ought to judge every teaching and every religious approach to doctrine and God's theology is this question, is it of the new creation? God gave us the law to begin with, but things have changed, folks. There's a new order. There's a new work. there's, There's something new that God has done through Jesus Christ. And so the question is, is this of the new creation? And we live our lives in light of that question identifying with that which is of the new creation, disassociating from that which is not. All right, the end of verse 16, he says, upon the Israel of God, and this is a very interesting little section of Galatians. Who is he referring to? What in the world? Who in the world is a group of people called the Israel of God? Some would believe that this is a reference to the church, I think you might be hard stretched to prove that. I'm not saying that I can disprove it, but to assume that this is a reference to uh, to the church, uh, at least is not an obvious conclusion. Um, In fact, the first repetition of the preposition upon that you see there, where he says um, in verse uh, number uh, 16, upon the Israel of God. It seems as if there's a separation between that and the peace and mercy that is upon the previous group. So it seems like there's kind of a break in the way it's worded there. There's peace and there's mercy upon those who walk according to this rule and also upon the Israel of God. And so it seems that he's referencing likely two separate groups here. So who is the group in view? Um, In fact, uh, of the other 65 occurrences of the term Israel in the New Testament, all of them refer to the Jews. So of the other times that we see the reference in the New Testament of Israel, it never refers to the church. And that's where some of the covenant theology or reformed theology maybe gets things a bit off in their thinking. But clearly in the New Testament, anytime the term Israel is used, it's a reference to the Jewish people, believers, uh, but those who are Jews. And so it seems that Paul here is making sure after he just says circumcision matters nothing and uncircumcision matters nothing, he says, yeah, but the Israel of God, the Jewish people still are valued and treasured by God. And so Paul is careful here in the midst of confronting legalism and the law and circumcision to affirm the value and the significance that he has for the Israelite people, for the Jews as well as God himself. And I find that interesting that he includes that there. But uh, mercy and peace upon the Israel of God. There's also an Israel that's not of God, right? And that's what he's dealing with here. Jews who think they're okay because they're jumping through all the hoops ceremoniously and feast-wise, etc., but they are not the Israel of God. And so he affirms these Jews who are willing to come out and be separate from this false teaching. 
may I say to you tonight as it relates to the inconsistency. So basically Paul here in verse 16 is saying everybody can be blessed by God if they'll come to him by grace alone. The Jew, the Gentile, the circumcised, the uncircumcised. One of the ways I've found to identify the false gospel is when the gospel people preach, listen to me, does not apply to every person in every place. Do you know how many of our religious standards we have that do not apply to a believer in Jamaica? I'm just thinking dress or music or whatever. I'm not saying we go crazy. I'm just saying we're so westernized in our thinking. We have so much religiosity that has nothing to do with something that applies to every person on every place on this planet that is a sinner who needs one savior to avoid going to one destination instead to go to another destination. The gospel of Jesus Christ is universal in its preaching on the need and in its universal application of the solution. And a lot of our religiosity is not that, uh, and therefore is not of grace alone. Nothing wrong with standards, but I'm saying where it's a conviction that either we're right with God or we're not based upon it. That wanders out of grace plus nothing kind of teaching. And so Paul here is very careful to thread the needle of these different groups and make sure we understand that when it's of grace alone, it applies to every individual. This final question this area, and we'll get to our last point, who is the rule in your life? What is the rule, R-U-L-E, as Paul references here in your life? If it, if it is anything other than grace, it will not be of God. The standard is grace. The standard is this grace plus nothing. That alone gives us relationship with God. And so the grace of God elevates us above these external standards, rituals, and inconsistencies. All right, let's end. Number two, look at verse 17. From henceforth, let no man trouble me. For I, Paul says, bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Number two, probably my favorite part of our study tonight, allow grace to elevate you unto independent liberties. Allow grace to elevate you unto independent liberties. Um, have you noticed that we Christians have a hard time agreeing on how to observe certain holidays? I'm talking like American holidays, like, you know, this is of the devil if you worship this, you know, Christmas trees are this, or Halloween is that, and I'm not trying to open a can of worms. We probably all have our opinions on that. A friend of mine was talking about how God's been growing him in some areas, and, and again, this is just tongue-in-cheek, so don't go to seed on this. I'm not picking on you if you have some convictions about some of these um, holidays. But he said this, I love this. He said, I'm so free in Christ right now, I can go trick-or-treating wearing an Easter bunny costume while singing, here comes Santa Claus. That's how free I am. I can do all of those with no, no guilt whatsoever. I'm just free. Isn't it funny how much those kind of things bring bondage? Um, and it's not because of a personal conviction. It's just others imposing sometimes those things upon us. And if you have a uh, something in your life that you, I have family that have certain things in those areas, but we're free from that in the sense of our identity. If I abstain from a holiday, that doesn't change my standing with God. If I go full-throated and thronged into that holiday to observe it, that doesn't change my standing with God. It's grace plus nothing. And so this freedom that Paul has, he wants for us. He wants for these who are reading. So I'll give you two things as we finish. Number one, notice there's an independent submission. So Paul in verse 17 is not saying, now because of the grace of God, I'm just skipping my way wherever I want to go, doing whatever I want to do. That is not what he says. Did you notice the verse, verse 17, let no man bother me. And you would think then what would follow would be, and I'm going to retire in some convenient, comfortable setting of my choosing. He says, for I bear in my body the marks of the what? Lord Jesus it frees us, listen to me, to stop submitting to man and to fully say yes to God alone. That's what the grace of God does. And that's an amazing thing to do. You ever done that? Come forward in a service when that's the last thing you want to do. Open up in your small group. Say something to your spouse that you've never shared. Just, just being totally, God told me to say this or do this. And I don't necessarily care what you think or how you receive it. I just know God has told me to say or to do or to be. It gives us the freedom to fully submit to God. Um, and I know this is probably going to hurt you as it does me tonight, but it's amazing to me how many things that we hold out on God with. 
Um, God, help my kids to not be axe murderers, help them to be fine, upstanding citizens, but please don't call them to be a missionary. Um, And we're always positioning them for success instead of saying, God, what do you want with them? And what do you want me to do as a parent or a grandparent? We're always, we give God some, but then there's things that restrict that. And what the grace of God is trying to do is free us to fully say yes to God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our lives to surrender to him. And Paul here says, I will not be a slave of man because God is my master. Jesus is Lord in my life. He doesn't worry about what they had to say about him, what they think about him, how they feel about him. He bears in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. And there's kind of a play on cultural things we wouldn't fully appreciate, but typically a bond servant would have something all into his ear um, that would symbolize he's owned by someone, some other marks on the body of that man is owned by that man, or he's a servant of that household, just like we do cattle. Paul's branding was the beatings and the shipwreck and the stoning and all that his body had suffered. And then he said, you want to talk about flesh? Let's talk about flesh. God owns me. And it's obvious to all what God has allowed in my life. I surrender fully to it, despite what you think. And so until our relationship with God is based and sustained by nothing but grace, we will continue to be controlled by and manipulated by others. Nothing frees us from the fear of man more than committing entirely to the grace of God. Um, Even as a leader, I experienced this, where folks, you know, try to manipulate or steer things in a certain direction. Um, And it's so freeing just to follow what God leads me to do. And I hope you have that same liberty in your home and in your life. That doesn't lower the bar. Listen to me, that elevates the bar. I'm not settling for what man thinks. I'm not settling for their standards. I'm doing what God has called me to do. So it is independent submission. Then lastly, verse 18, probably my favorite verse of of this book, just because of how Paul masterfully under the Holy Spirit's influence and inspiration words this, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this one he surrendered to, be with your spirit. Amen. Lastly, independent spirit. When it's all about grace, it elevates us to independent liberties. First of all, independent submission to God. Number two, independent spirit. The apostle now is about to lay down his pen. Can you, can you see him? struggling as brother john is doing to write right now with with his left hand only can you can you visualize paul trying to strain to get this last verse out and how does he end he ends with grace he writes the word grace one more time re-emphasizing this is my prayer for you this is my yearning for you that your that god's grace would be with not your flesh but your spirit i love that grace spirit that which is intangible that which is truly who we are. And so even here, Paul is reminding the Galatians of the message of his letter, and that is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's both how he started, and it's how he finishes. And may I say to you tonight, we will both, finish, we will both start and finish with God's grace and the spirit that produces in us when we rely upon it alone. Um. I think often our spirit is not as free as we want it to be. I don't know what you, if your spirit is weighed down tonight, and maybe there's some things that have been vexing your spirit or bothering you, but there's no antidote. There's no soothing um, balm, if you will, for the soul and for the heart and for the spirit uh, like the grace of God. Uh, so I encourage you to lean into that and absorb that and process that in the areas that God brings you conviction and encouragement tonight. Um, Somebody was talking about this idea of independence, and they said this. I think this is good. We all struggle with this probably in areas. He said, we are in danger of holding the reins of tradition so tightly that we may never let go and let God have his way. Um, And I'm not thinking of anything specific for those of you concerned about your tradition or mine. I'm just saying sometimes everything but God has control of the reins. And what grace is always trying to do is free us from that. If the tradition is from God, stick with it, brother or sister. But many times the tradition supplants God and replaces God, and maybe it's license. It could be the other end of the spectrum. But we can't say yes to God because that rules and reigns in our lives. Legalists long for uniformity and conformity, all under their consolidated control. Have you figured that out yet? That's what they want. It's about control. 
Grace-fueled believers are free to follow the Spirit of God in ways always aligned with general biblical principles, but individually are their own walks and ministries. It's individual, it's personal, um, it's freedom to follow how God is leading. As we finish this book and our study this evening, um, Paul obviously wrote quite a bit of the New Testament, right? A lot of them epistles, we would call them, letters to churches. And someone said this in relation to the church in America. He said this, if Paul saw the church in America, and I would add to that with all of our extremes that are away from grace, either toward legalism or license, if Paul saw the church in America, we'd be getting a letter. Wouldn't we? And here's my concern tonight. What would be in that letter that confronts where we're not getting grace right? I think that would be at the top of his list. It would not be the superficial things that we wish the church would hear from Paul on or Jesus Christ from on. It would be these core things. May God help us to receive the letter that he inspired and preserved, not just for the Galatians and the churches in this region, but for us this evening. Anything, I'll say it one more time as we finish, anything less or more than grace causes us to settle for a debased existence. Only grace plus nothing allows us to live on the higher plane that God originally intended and for which he has given us his grace. Will you tonight choose to live in grace plus nothing by allowing it to elevate your motivations to a higher level, to a higher glory, and to a higher standard? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight.